Today we're beginning a new series, and it's called Kingdom Come. Now, this picture is an amazing picture of Algoma's lighthouse that was taken by our very own Patty Rain. Yay! Yay. Patty, are you in here? Right over there, yes! Thank you for allowing us to use this picture. I fell in love. I was searching, I, I was searching online for Algoma and uh, just pictures because I wanted this series to, for us to say, no, it's not King, God's kingdom come in the world, but it's God's kingdom come here, here. God has a purpose here. When I saw this picture, I was like, that looks so much like Algoma's lighthouse. And then I found out it was taken by <laughs> Patty. And I was like, ah, it was awesome. So thank you. I'm, I'm really excited. Now, I want you to think about a question. If Jesus lived in Algoma, what would it be like? How would Algoma be if Jesus lived in our town? What would our church look like if Jesus lived in our town? What would the city be like? You know, you wonder, would, would there be homeless people if Jesus lived here? Would there be domestic violence if Jesus lived here? Would schools be different? Would politics here be different? I mean, what does Jesus want to do here? And how does Lakeside Community Church and the Universal Church, the other churches in our area, how do we fit in to that plan? That's what this series is going to be about. What does Jesus want it to be like here? Now, I am a sucker for audience participation, so I have a question for you. I want you to participate. What are some words that come to your mind? And these are positive, not negative. Okay. What are some words that come to your mind when you think of what the church should be like? What should the church be like here? All-inclusive, loving, unified, serving, caring, generous, welcoming, forgiving. I'm good, aren't I? I was like, whoo, heard it in stereo. Any other words come to your mind what the church should be like? A force for the good. A force for good. The good. An example. A lampstand, a light in darkness. And full of sinners. A, a place full of sinners. Thank goodness, because I'm one. What did you say? Family. Oh, I love that word. You're right. Family. Okay, those are some beautiful words. That's what the church should be. Is that what people outside of these doors think of when they think of church? No. What? No. Really? <laughs> they don't, which breaks my heart. What do they think of? They think of things like words like judgmental. And boring, fighting, making everybody behave. I mean, these are not the words you want to hear. These are not the words that I think are reflective of what the kingdom should be. And that's what the series is about. What does Jesus want this community, this church family to look like? And how does Jesus want us to engage our local community? I realize that you probably, knowing that you've been through Matthew in three years, and I think you got to chapter 7. I could be wrong. I know that you've heard this passage before, but I can't help it because to me, this passage is probably one of the most vital passages in helping us understand what Jesus wants the church to look like. I think it's a great introduction to the series. And so we're going um, to look at today at the Lord's Prayer. You know, the Our Father who art in heaven. How many of you know that by heart? Good, good. Now, I, you need to know something about me. After seminary, I became a full-time youth pastor. Now, I did not grow up in church. You need to know that, okay? And um, I, when I became that youth pastor, one of the duties that I was not aware of when I took the job, but it was awesome, was that I was the chaplain for the high school football team in our area. Now, not growing up in church, I was very unfamiliar with the Lord's Prayer. I'd heard of it. I might have heard it a couple of times on TV, but that was pretty much it. And when I went to seminary, there was no class on the Lord's Prayer. It just wasn't there. And I had never played organized sports, and so I had no idea what to expect in the locker room. And I remember that first game there, and I'd been at the practices and getting to know some of the kids and the coach, and it was awesome. So we're there, all the guys, they're on their knees, helmets in hand, and the coach is giving them some kind of cursed out pep talk that was just awesome. And, um, and so, and, and as he's finished and he goes, Pastor Don, lead us in the Lord's Prayer. I want you to know I have never panicked more in my life 
than that moment right there with those 30 or 40 guys. I said my own private prayer saying, God, I need a miracle. I need the words of God to come into my life right now because I only knew the first line. That's all I knew. Our Father who art in heaven, that's all I had. I mean, seriously, promise you, had no idea even where to go next. So there I was, and I did. I was like, all right. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And thank God, everybody in that room started saying the prayer. Here I am going, Cheerios and watermelon, Cheerios and watermelon, just so it looked like I knew what I was talking about. But I had no idea what was going on. Now, the good news is I have since learned the Lord's Prayer. So we're good. We're good. Now, as we get started today, I want to do something that more traditional churches all over the world do every single Sunday. So would you stand up with me and hold on, let me get to it. Stand up with me. I know, be like, oh, stand and sit, stand and sit. I know. <laughs> but would you pray this prayer along with me? It's on the screen if you don't know it. You ready? All right. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Nice job. Now, this is not just an amazing prayer. This prayer gives insight into what Jesus truly thinks is important. It paints a picture of what church family should be like. And unfortunately, when you have a passage of Scripture that is so familiar, it often becomes unfamiliar to us because we're just so used to the words that we don't even think about them anymore. We get so accustomed that we forget what they mean. Or sometimes we get so accustomed to them that we forget that we have no idea what they mean. But they're that familiar. And so to get some perspective, what I thought would be good is this day, when we refer to this passage of Scripture, I want to use a different translation. Because what, what, you, what we said was the King James Version. It's the one most of us have grown up with or have heard on TV. But um, there's another translation of the Bible called the New Living Translation, which is just a lot more modern. It's not better. In fact, there are some times I'm like, I like other translations better. But it's modern, and it helps us to see things in a little bit different way. So I wanted to just read this one. <clears throat> it says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. You know, when the disciples were watching Jesus, they saw him pray in a way they had never seen anybody pray before. They saw an intimacy between Jesus and his father that they just hadn't experienced. And they wanted a little bit of that. So they were like, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And this is the prayer he kind of gave them as a sample, kind of an example of how to pray. And it does contain some powerful insights because it, does, it starts, our Father in heaven. Our Father. Do you notice something about this? That Jesus never said, my Father. He said, our Father. Because the Father is not just Jesus' Father. He's not just my Father and your Father. He's our Father. And he's not some far-off ruler or judge. That's what so many of us think, is God is this, this judge in the sky. But no, he's not a judge who doesn't care anything about us. He's daddy. Unfortunately, in this, our Father in heaven, most translations, including both of the ones we used this morning, don't do a great job on this translation of our Father in heaven. Because in the Greek, which is the original language, heaven is not singular. It's plural. Our Father in the heavens. Now, I realize that it's not that big of a deal theologically because heaven and heavens are often interchangeable in Scripture. But I, I think that when you look at heavens plural, it changes something about the relationship because it's kind of like our Father in the heavens that surround us. 
See, when I think of our Father in heaven, I think I'm here, you are way up there. I'm here, you are distant. Our Father in heaven, the guy, the man upstairs, he's the one who's far away. But that's, that's not what this is saying. Our Father in the surrounding heavens, the heavens that surround us. God is a Father who is near us. He walks with us. He is by us. See, distance is so significant for relationship. My dad, he died last November. And um, to be honest with you, most of my adult life, I lived in Florida. My dad lived in Virginia. And we just didn't talk to each other that much. We loved each other. You know, we'd call on Thanksgiving and Christmas. But literally, six to eight months would go by and we wouldn't have said a word to each other. Not because we didn't like each other. Don't hold it against me. I do a lot worse things than that. But... <laughs> Months would go by and we just wouldn't talk. It's just the way the relationship was. And then we'd get together and it would be great. But about three years ago, I moved to, I mean, I didn't move. I started going to Liberty University in Virginia. And I was having to go there five uh, or six times a year for class. And I would go there for a week each time. And it just so happened, it wasn't on purpose, it wasn't intentional. My dad lived about an hour away from the school. And so every time I would go up, we would have dinner together or I would go over and, uh, and we'd spend some time together. And it was awesome. I, I can just think about how many times we'd stand in his kitchen talking for hours. We would solve all the world's problems. If only the president would have called us, it would have been done. We would reminisce about like our favorite History Channel shows. And it's so funny because, you know, we'd start talking and everybody would be in the kitchen. And after a little while, it was just my dad and I. And I'm like, what? Nobody else is getting excited about the history of Mesopotamia? Come on! This is awesome! And so we were just had this amazing relationship during that time. And I, I really, as I was reading through this passage, I'm like, distance really changes the relationship. Because I love my dad. I always have loved my dad. But when we were far away... The relationship was just, it was distant. It wasn't bad. It was just distant. But when we were put together, the relationship flourished. And we had so much fun together. And see, I think it's the same way with God. When we think of our Father in heaven, the man upstairs, we aren't drawn to that relationship. But when we think of our Father in the surrounding heavens, our Father around us, well, it's like my daddy is right here. The intimacy and the conversation flows so much more naturally. So our Father in the heavens surrounding us. And then it continues, may your name be kept holy. See, may your name be kept holy. If it's a faraway father, the man upstairs, it means don't you ever say anything bad about God and that name because that name is special and important. Kind of like a principal or a policeman or you just don't say bad things about it. Yeah, that sounds like a great relationship. <laughs> but my children, when they think of daddy, daddy in my house is kind of a special name. It is a name that is soaked up with relationship. My girls, if somebody said something bad about their daddy, there is a possibility that they would punch him in the nose. <laughs> and if they do, I will give them ice cream. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, they respect policemen and they respect uh, the principal, but... The name of daddy, they respect in a very different relational way. Daddy is precious. They know I'd sa I, I sacrifice for them. They know I'd give up everything for them. And sometimes they curse my name, but they always come back and say they're sorry after the week in the room or whatever, no phone forever or whatever. <laughs> but daddy is precious. Jesus was saying, Father, God, and the, the, the one who surrounds us, we treasure your name. Your name is more precious than any other name. Isn't that so different than the principle we often view it? And then G Jesus continued. This is where we're going to camp most of the day. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I've got to be honest. This sounds so normal. Yeah. Am I go going in and out? Sorry, see if it's me. You know, most, time, most of the time we think this is saying, you know, Father, may your will be done in my life. May I stop sinning. May, may I start obeying you. And while I'm sure those things are important, kingdom to Jesus meant something entirely different because kingdom for Jesus was, was a word that had a 2,000-year-old history to him. 
there was, a, and we talked about this at the beginning of the summer, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just kind of show you. In the very beginning of the Hebrew um, identity, way back in Genesis 12, God came to Abram, and it says, the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your fa- father's family. Go, so you, know, you are living in present-day Iraq. Go to a land I will show you. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I'll tell you when you get there. And so he did, and Abram leaves. And he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. And this is the key. All the families on earth, all the Jewish families, all the Abrahamic children families, no, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. See, for Jesus and for the, the Jews, Kingdom was a picture of God committing himself to a people, Abraham's descendants, to accomplish his will and his purpose. And what was that will and purpose? To bring the entire world to himself. Abraham's descendants had a purpose, and that was, and we've said it all summer long, to be a priest to the nations, to help the nations discover how much God wanted them. So for Jesus and all the first century Jews, the word kingdom meant, you can look on the screen, God's dream for the world. God's dream for the world. The way God wanted the world to be. So what did God dream about? If you want to know, read the prophets in the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible. The prophets, they always were painting this picture of kingdom, of what God would do someday. In 600 years before Jesus was born, A man named Isaiah prophesied that one day, one day, who knows when, a Messiah will come, the anointed one of God, a Savior, would come and save his people. And this is the passage that Jesus quoted early on in his ministry. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. See, this passage in Isaiah was almost considered like part of the job description for the promised Messiah. The Messiah would one day usher in God's kingdom. One day, this this person, this Messiah, would come and make the world the way it should be. And so you look at it, and you see, good news preached to the poor. And that day, the poor were like, They were the ones who were not blessed. If you wanted to know who was loved by God, you looked at the rich, not the poor, because the poor, they obviously were rejected by God. That was the thinking. But then Jesus says, no, 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 no. The Messiah is going to bring good news to those who are rejected, to the ones nobody loves. Captives will be released. The blind will see. The oppressed will be set free. And the Lord's favor will come. See, in God's dream for the world, Those who are on the outside are invited on the inside. Diseases are healed. Addictions are overcome. Injustices are made right. Domestic violence is ended. Human trafficking is abolished. In the kingdom, what a glorious day that will be when what is bad is made good. What is wrong is made right. And when Jesus, he quoted this messianic job description, do you remember what he said next? He's in Nazareth in a synagogue. He, he sits down, which is what they did when they taught, which is just bizarre to me, so nobody could see. But anyway, I don't know, I'm not judging that. He sits down, he reads this passage of Scripture, and then it says, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. And you can imagine, I mean, he reads the job description of the Messiah. And all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. And then he began to speak to them. And he said, the Scripture you've just heard, has been fulfilled this very day. Boom! They don't believe him, so they threaten to kill him, and he he says, fine, and he leaves town. That's the town he grew up in. They're like, we know you. We know your dad. We know your mom. Uh Uh-uh. Get out, you know, and um, and he leaves, and he he doesn't do any miracles there, and he's like, seriously, (laughs) this is a big deal because Jesus was saying, I am the Messiah. I came to usher in God's kingdom his dream for the world. So he started healing the blind and he started raising the dead. Hello. And he started doing all of these miracles. The lame could walk, the deaf could hear. 
And, he, and all is an example to say the kingdom is coming. The kingdom has come in me. The kingdom has come. This was such a huge claim. They did not understand what it meant, his kingdom coming. And I would say that most of us don't understand that either. Let me ask you, his dream, has it been completely fulfilled yet? Of course not. We saw evidence of that last Sunday with, with the Las Vegas shooting. It's not completely here, but guess what? It started. It started. Because there is a people who follow God by their faith in Jesus Christ, his promised Messiah. There is a people whose purpose is to be the tangible presence of God in the world. There is a people who are called, who have a purpose to be his hands and feet, empowered by his spirit, willing to sacrifice their own kingdom, their own will, their own comforts, their own pleasures, their own plans and goals, to submit them to the plans and goals and desires of their Lord. That picture, that people, is us. The church is called to be the tangible presence of Jesus in the world. In anticipation that one day, all will be made right. There is a day when our Lord is coming, and all will be made right. Amen. And that is such a glorious hope that we have. And, you know, as I was reading this, I was like, this is kind of crazy talk. I mean, this is amazing. <sighs> This blows me away because, you know, as a guy, who, and forgive me, I'm not patting myself on the back. I, I have told you before, I'm a doubter by nature. When my wife passed away when I was in my 20s, caused me to go on this like doubt thing forever. And what it has done is it's made me a studier because I want to learn what is true and what is right. And when I, when I have done so much study on Jesus and, and the evidence and the reality that what is in Scripture really happened, you're like, this crazy stuff is real. Oh, my goodness. There really, there really is a day coming when all that is wrong will be made right. And I am so excited about that day. But until then, guess what? We are the tangible presence of Jesus in the world. We are his instrument for his kingdom to come. You know, when we pray your kingdom come, your will be done, we're not praying, God, make your kingdom exist. His kingdom is alive and well right now. His will is happening all throughout his kingdom. What we're praying when we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven, we're praying that, God, your kingdom and your will come into my will and my kingdom because you have been purposely excluded from my kingdom you have been purpose your will is purposely excluded from my will how do i know because i keep want, i keep doing the things that i want to do <laughs> I, he has given us the freedom to say no and usually we do <laughs> we're good at saying no when jesus said pray your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven god your will is done all over the place i invite there's one, one place I have, a, it doesn't, it, it's not allowed to flourish in my life. In our life, God, your will be done. Your kingdom come here in this place, in, these, in my life. We are a church, a people who follow Christ, who are available as his instruments to bring love and healing and restoration and redemption where it is currently not. And you know this as followers of Jesus, those of you who have chosen to follow Jesus, it costs a lot. It's hard. Following Jesus, it's not like I finally followed Jesus and now all the lights turn green and my children obey. And I was going to say something about mother-in-laws, but that'd be wrong. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I'm just like, but you know, it's like Everything has gone great now because I follow Jesus. In fact, it's been the opposite for my life. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden you're suffering, you're, you're saying no to things that you used to say yes to, and, but at the same time, all of a sudden you're finding hope and peace that, and joy that you never experienced before because you find that it's not about what we say no to, it's about what we say yes to. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my life and in our life as it already is in heaven. So following Jesus is about his will and his kingdom. 
And we are promised that if we die to ourselves and pursue his dream, we will find life in a dream that we could have never imagined. I mean, and you know this, those of you who follow Jesus, just, and you pray his kingdom come in your life and his will be done in your life, that as we heal, we find we are healed. As we restore, we can't explain it, but we are restored. As we forgive, we experience forgiveness. And as we love, we find that we are loved in ways that we could not have imagined. See, we are the people of God, His hands and feet, available to make His dream a reality. So may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think, though, one of the hardest aspects of, of praying this prayer. As Americans, this part is the, probably the most difficult part. And it's this, this idea of community. Because if you look, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done as it is in heaven. You're going to see in just a minute the hours and the we's. It, is never, it never says I. Never once in this, this whole prayer does it say I. See, God's people are called to be a community, a family. I love uh, over here, can't remember who it was. Somebody said, it's family. Oh, I think it was you. And um, we are a family. Kingdom has little to do with you and me. It has so much to do with us and him. It's not about me. <laughs> Choosing to follow Jesus, it's an individual decision. You can choose to deny Jesus or to accept him. That is your decision. But you cannot be a growing follower of Christ by yourself. You can't. You can be a Christian. You can say yes to Jesus, but you cannot be a growing follower of Christ all by yourself. It takes a family. You, you can get smarter through personal Bible study, and I encourage you to do that. Get smart, read the Bible, experience God. It's beautiful. You can, you can love on Jesus through singing and praying, and I encourage you to do it. But if your identity in Christ is limited to the per, your personal activities or just showing up to church to kind of be a consumer of God stuff, you're going to struggle. Your faith is going to feel empty. You're going to wonder what's missing in life. And maybe that's where you are. I want to encourage you. What's missing often is community. It's being a family. It's doing this thing called the Christian life, doing it together. Because that's what God designed us to do. He, he designed us to grow in family. Watching church on TV, that's not family. And if that's, that's like what you do, that's your thing, that's, it's okay. I mean, I guess it's better than watching some of the other stuff that's out there, but that's not family. Signing a form and joining a church is good. Become a member of whatever church you're going to, but that's not family because family is being in a relationship. Family is being vulnerable with each other. It's loving each other and serving each other and then working together to serve the world. Churches, we, you know, we try to create opportunities to do this family thing. Well, we have service teams, which many of you are on. Thank you. It makes it possible for us to meet together. I mean, we have teams leading in our children's ministry right now and greeting and handing out bulletins and serving food and singing. I mean, all of these teams are awesome. And, and often, that's one of the ways you can experience family, doing that together. We, we have small groups. Another tool that, that we're trying to create opportunities for family. By joining a small group, are you automatically part of a family? No, because it's a, you know, you, you got to actually show up. you got to be a little bit vulnerable. But when we do that, you can, you can see things happen. And over time, all of a sudden, relationships form that would have never formed before. And that's, that's awesome. But there's so much more to just like be, so much more than being a part of a program. It's being intentional with our lives. I, I really want to encourage you, eat meals with other people. Get to know other people. Have them in your home or around your fire. and Invite them into your life. Allow people that you trust to know your struggles. Allow some, someone or a couple of people to hold you accountable. Yet you know they're the kind of people who are going to love you regardless. See, that, that's family. That's how we grow. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in us as it is in heaven. God, may the community that you desire May the community that you experience as Father, Son, and Spirit 
lead us to be a family together. That is a great prayer. You can see the community aspect in the rest of the prayer, like I said, and we're going to kind of go through this quick. It says, give us, the group, today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. This is so different than if it was just me. Give me the food I need. It's kind of selfish sounding even when I say it. But give us today the food that we need. All of a sudden, it's like we're in this together. For, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. You know, most of us have always thought this is saying, give me my bread, forgive my debts, lead me not into temptation. But that's just not what Jesus said. He said, it's not about me or you. It is about us. Give us the food we need, Lord. Meet our needs. You know, food was such a big deal back then. People did not eat, uh, like, by default. If there was a drought, you literally could go without food. Here, it's a little bit tougher to go without food. But maybe it's a job. You're just desperate for a job. Or maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's a need for a pastor. Maybe it's wisdom for our elders as they map out a plan. See, Jesus teaches us to pray for the things that concern us, acknowledging that all we have is from God. See, that's the key. Lord, give us today the food we need. You are our provider. You are the one who provides. My job is not the provider. You are the provider. Because the farmer plants, but God causes the food to grow. The surgeon operates, but God causes his hands to work. The teacher teaches, but God is the one who gave them a voice. See, we do our part. We teach, and we do the surgery, and we, we plant the seed, and we, all of the jobs that we do, we do our part. But we have to know that we are only able to do that because of the stuff that God's done first, giving us a voice, helping our hands work, helping our mind work, whatever it is. It's God who's given this. We didn't earn it. I did not earn the ability to be able to speak to you today. It is a gift. I wish you would have gifted me with a voice that is more like, you know, a beautiful... Actually, a teenager walked by me a little while ago and said hello, and I was like, I want your voice. I mean, it was like, man, why do I sound like a mouse and all these other people sound so... <laughs> but still, the voice that he gave me, as high-pitched as it is, no, nobody has ever... I've never called and somebody said, yes, sir. Um, but it's the way it is. The voice is from God. And he, he content, Jesus continues, forgive us our sins we have forgi- as we have forgiven those who sin against us. I mean, God created humanity to be his family, and we rejected him, right? And in response, he did the unthinkable. And it's in the, it was the whole song that we sang, the last song. God became human. Why? It wasn't because he was just dying to know what it was like to be a human. I mean... He humbled himself, came to the earth so that he could be punished and killed for our sin. See, justice had to be served, but none of us were capable of justice. We were completely incapable to pay the price. So rather than condemn us, Jesus took on the condemnation. Jesus took our punishment on the cross. He didn't have to, but for whatever reason, he deems us worth it. Amen. Amen. So now we have forgiveness, and if he can forgive us, of course we can forgive others, the pain they've caused us. But what if they don't ask for it? Forgive. What if they don't deserve it? I didn't when Jesus forgave me. Forgive. Now, hear this, because I'm winding up, but you need to hear this. Forgiveness does not mean that you trust somebody who continually betrays you. That's not what forgiveness is. You don't have to keep going back and getting hurt. I mean, that's, that's not... Forgiveness doesn't mean that you pursue a harmful or destructive relationship. Forgiveness means you say, I don't hold your actions against you. I'm not going to allow bitterness to creep into my life. Use wisdom in forming the relationships you have. It's not... I, I said this, you know, over the summer. It's not okay for somebody to hurt you to hit you, to emotionally abuse you. That's not what this is about. Forgiveness says, I'm not holding that against you, but now be wise in the relationships that you have. Get help, get counsel. Those are good things. But Jesus is saying, forgive, because you have been forgiven so much that when somebody cuts you off, which happens a lot, 
in Sun Prairie and Madison. When somebody does, allows their dog to poo on your lawn and not clean it up, which happens daily in my life. I'm not bitter. <laughs> when, when people do stupid things, when, you're, when your you know, parents or kids say things that just hurt you or your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend, they say things that just hurt you. That hurt is not near as bad as what I did to God in my sin. And he said, I forgive you. I'm going to do everything I can to forgive you. Whew. All right. So, and then the final thing is, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Rescue us so that we can be your instruments for your kingdom, so that we can rescue others, or be your instruments to rescue others and give them life. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Not my will, not my kingdom, not our kingdom and will, but yours, God. So, where do we go from here? As we begin this new, path, this new journey for looking, uh, as we begin this journey looking for a new pastor, I want to encourage you. We are not on hold. We're not on hold. See, the church is not about a pastor. And the church is not about a building. The church is about the people of God saying yes to God. That is what the church is. And by the way, you don't need a pastor to do that. We are saying yes to Jesus every day, every time we come together. And we are going to continue doing that. The church is a family of people who follow Jesus, seeking his will to be done in our midst, in us, and through us. So during this, this pastor search, let's pursue being a kingdom family. See, church is not a place you go. It's a family you belong to. And this I'm telling you, look at me, if, you, if I bored you and you fall asleep, wake up, hello, we're here, look at me. Lakeside Community Church is an amazing family. I have been a part of a lot of church families in my life. This is special. You have found a good place. Invest here. Love these people because they will love you. This is an amazing family. And during this pastor church, this pastor search, I don't know what the, all of that urge is. There's just search and church. And anyway, um, during this search, be a family that encourages each other. Be a family that is committed to each other. Be a family that, that wants to have some fun together. Be a family that does not get stuck on the petty things that it's easy to fight about when things aren't going great. I'm a Miami Dolphin fan. We know what it's like to lose a lot, Okay. And it's amazing. When we are winning, like last year, we went like 10 games, nine games in a row and didn't lose a game. And it's so funny how when you, you hear Dolphin fans talk, they're like, this is great. This is awesome. It doesn't matter that we're like, you know, uh, leading the league in uh, the, the negative, like it, poorly. We're leading the lead in, in the bad way we uh, are able to defend the pass. We're the worst. We're the worst. But it doesn't matter because we've won nine games in a row. Go Dolphins. But you lose two in a row like we have the last couple of weeks. And I mean, we complain about everything. Stupid quarterback. Stupid coach. I mean, the coach last year was kind of nominated to be like Jesus' secondhand man. I mean, you know, it was like, we haven't been in the playoffs in 10 years. But we went, this man is awesome. We've lost two games. They're like, get him out of here. It's time for another coach. Like, this is ridiculous. Don't be like that. Don't be fickle like a Miami Dolphin fan, <laughs> which I am a great one. <laughs> Seriously, when, when times are tough and there's uncertainty and transition, we can complain about all the, just the pettiest things, um, you know, and, and we'll complain about the volume, the temperature. We'll complain about everything like, oh, our church would just be so good if we could finally get a pastor who doesn't confuse search for church and <laughs> stupid things like that. Don't be that way. Don't be petty. Be encouraging. Be uplifting. Support each other. Support what God is doing in this place. Support the elders because they are doing an amazing job in this process of leading us, trying to put together a plan so that we can, we can get the, the pastor who is the right fit, the God's man for this place. So have patience with them. Encourage them. Love on them. Love on each other. I asked the question at the very beginning, what would it be like if Jesus lived in Algoma? Here's the answer. He does. <laughs> you are the tangible presence of Jesus in this community. 
You are the hands and feet of Jesus in this community. He lives here, right here. Through the power and prompting of his Holy Spirit, we are part of his plan to bring people to him. This isn't my church. It's not your church. Lakeside Community Church is his church, but it is our family. It's our family. As we begin this series about what the kingdom looks like and and all, I challenge you this week. I want to challenge you. Memorize the Lord's Prayer. For some of you, it's so easy because you already did. Memorize the Lord's Prayer. If you don't know where it is, you can take a picture of the screen, (laughs) write it down, whatever you want to do. Matthew 6, 9 through 11. I will encourage you, if you've already memorized it, I would encourage you all week, read it in a different translation. Because I want to encourage you every day, all of you, all of us, would you read the Lord's Prayer every day? Make this your prayer. But if it's so familiar to you, use a different translation. Because I don't care what translation you use, this prayer is awesome as it helps us to remember to invite Jesus into our kingdom and our life and our will. The Lord's Prayer is so much more than a rote prayer. It's an invitation to participate in God's dream for the world. Now, I would be remiss to say, if you have never chosen his dream over yours, if you've never chosen to follow Jesus, you can do that today. God wants to walk with you. He is in the heavens surrounding you. He wants his will and his kingdom to be in your life because there is nothing better. Does it make it easy? But it makes it better. It doesn't make it, you know, uh, simple. But it makes it good and joyful. You can follow Jesus today. It doesn't take magic words. It's a decision. Jesus, I follow you. I'm sick of leave, living my life for me. I follow you. And if you choose to do that, I want you to write on that connection card and tell me because I would love to contact you this week just to give you some resources and to say welcome to the family because there is no greater joy. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you. I, I live my own kingdom too often. I do my own will too often. And when I repent and I give you control back of my life, and when I invite you and your will to be over mine, life doesn't necessarily get easier, but it is good and joyful, and it satisfies. And Lord, I pray, God, that you will help us as a family pursue you and your kingdom and your will more than our own. God, I pray that you change our hearts Help us to remember that no matter what happens, there is hope in you that one day all will be made right because you are good and you are faithful. And it is going to be okay no matter how bad it looks right now. Lord, I pray that you help us to be a kingdom-minded church so that the, the surrounding communities around here, they might not know a lot, but they know that this church loves Jesus and loves them. So use us. In your name we pray. Amen.